So hello and welcome. My name is Sam Connell. I'm one of the librarians at New Canaan Library. And tonight we have with us the Yale Science Communication, which is an organization of postdoctoral and graduate students and individuals passionate about science communication, education, and advocacy. They deliver talks on current topics in science. And tonight we're really lucky to have them here tonight as they present a game of cellular communication, how miscommunication causes disease. Thank you very much for joining us this evening and welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, thanks to the New Canaan Library for hosting us and thank you everyone for joining us tonight. As Sam mentioned, we're gonna talk about a game of cellular telephone and learn how miscommunication and that telephone call can cause diseases. So today, uh, I, Sanandini Chandra and Renuka are gonna coordinate the set of talks and we have three wonderful speakers lined up for you. First up is Krishna Mudambi, who works in the Department of Pharmacology at Yale Cancer Biology Institute. And he does research on timing of cancer signaling. And a fun fact, he was a member of the Boise City Council in high school. Next up, we have Christina Cho, who works in the Department of Immunobiology at Yale School of Medicine, and she does research on how tumors in our body resist immune surveillance. And outside of the lab, she loves to do the yoga as, in fact, a certified yoga instructor. And last but not the least, we have Erica Hoyos Ramirez, who's in the Department of Neuroscience at Yale School of Medicine. She does research on the molecular mechanisms of neuronal communication or communication within our brains. And an interesting and fun fact about her is that she recently learned how to roller skate. So all these three speakers are gonna to talk to you about communication, communication within our bodies. Sounds exciting, right? So I'll let uh, my fellow coordinator, Renuka, explain that a little bit more. Okay, so before we go into our individual talks, let's talk a little bit about communication. We all communicate, right, on a daily basis to our friends, our family, our coworkers, and we do this in several ways. It could be in person, over the phone, it could be a telephone or a cell phone, and even through email. And usually we communicate to convey some information. So if we think of a traditional phone conversation where there are two people talking through a corded telephone, there's usually a caller who makes the call and a receiver who picks up the call. And the information that the caller is transmitting travels through the cord and reaches the receiver. And what's really important for this to work is that the correct information from a caller goes to the intended receiver. Now, when this happens on a much larger scale, when there are many callers and many receivers, this can actually get quite complicated. But modern telecommunication systems have largely streamlined this process and ensured that even in a situation like this, caller and receiver pairs do not get mixed up. So similar to how many individuals are talking to each other in this room, our body can also be thought of as a room where there are multiple lines of communication happening on a second's basis. And this communication happens between cells. So cells are the fundamental units in our body and they perform all the functions required to stay alive. Our body is made up of trillions of cells are in different shapes, sizes, and these cells perform different functions depending on where they are present. So cells in the brain are often shaped like long spindles, skin cells are cuboidal shaped, and cells in the muscle can be of different shapes depending on what function they are performing. So our speakers today are gonna to be talking about cells in the brain, cancer cells, and how normal cells communicate with each other. So in order for cells to perform and coordinate all their functions, they need to be able to communicate. And they do this in a similar caller and receiver fashion. So cells can be thought of as bags that hold many molecules. And when they wanna communicate, these collar cells send out a specific type of molecule called a ligand. And this is received by, by a receiver cell, which has antennas to receive them. And these antennas are called receptors. So receptors on the receiver cell are specialized to recognize different ligands and bind to them. And so ligand and receptor pairs can be of unique shapes and sizes, and therefore different ligand receptor pairs dictate different downstream processes and result in specific functions. So imagine a world in which you could not communicate effectively. Everything would fall apart, right? So similar to that, the communication within the cells in our body that Renuka just talked about 
is important for us to perform our daily functions and is important for us to maintain good health. And our speakers are exactly going to talk about these three, uh, three th types of communication. So first up, uh, Krishna is going to talk more about what this communication is. Like these are the cells that pass along signals and how timing of the signaling can play a key role. So if things go wrong, if there's miscommunication, if we have diseases in our body, how we can alter the signal, how we can change the timing and actually make things right again. And then Christina and Eric are going to talk about two instances in which miscommunication occurs, we get diseases and how immunotherapy can help. So Christina is specifically going to talk about cancer and how these cancer cells hijack our cellular communication for their own benefit and how immunotherapy can help us combat that. And then Erica is going to talk about Alzheimer's disease, which happens when miscommunication occurs in a very important part of our body, the brain. And she's going to talk about more about the cells in the brain, which are neurons and how they communicate. So without further delay, I'll pass over the screen to Krishna. If you have any questions, we encourage you to use the chat window feature. At the end of all the three talks, we have special time for a Q&A session where we can address all your questions. Um, passing over the screen to Krishna now, where we can know how it's all about timing. Thank you, Renika. Let me start sharing my screen here. Hmm. Did that work? Yes, you must be. Okay, great. Uh, so, hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, as the moderators mentioned, my name is Krishna Madindi, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about cell to cell communication and how we believe that timing is a very important factor in this process. So, as our moderators already mentioned, cells are in constant communication with one another, right? And it's very important that they are because they need to know what's happening in their local environment, right? What's happening with their neighbor cells. Uh, they need to know what's happening with more distant cells. And also they need to know what's happening outside of our body, right? Uh, the outside environment also sends different signals and cues that our cells can respond to. So these different communications ultimately tell the cell how to respond and how to behave to what's happening either locally or more distantly. And some of the different things, that the way, and some of the different ways in which the cell can respond is by growth, for instance, right? Certain, cell, certain signals might tell the cell that it's now time to grow. Uh, other signals might tell the cell that it's now time to divide. Uh, still other signals might tell the cell when it's time to break down and uh, process food, right? Uh, something we call metabolism. And finally, another really important communication that cells receive is they need to know when it's time to die. And you can imagine that misunderstanding these signals or not properly following through with these signals can lead to different diseases, right? And I think Cancer is a great example of this, right? If a cell receives a signal that tells it that it's time to die, but instead it misinterprets the signal as, oh, it's time to grow or time to divide, you can think of how this could help uh, with something like tumor growth, as opposed to seeing the cell die, we might see it start to grow, which can be problematic for our body, right? And to understand this process, we need to, I think, further delve into how these cellular phone calls are made. So, to do that, we're gonna zoom in onto our little friendly cells here. So I've boxed off a region for you uh, to look at. These are called the membranes, right? Uh, our moderators mentioned this. They're basically barriers that help separate the outside environment from the inside of the cell. So they help protect the cell. Um, so now if we zoom into our collar and receiver cell, right? Our collar cells here on the left, our receiver cell with its antennae or receptors are on the right. So the collar cell sends out signals or ligands which bind specifically to individual receptors. And then these receptors come together and initiate a signaling complex that then sends the signal into the, into the cell, uh, telling, you know, telling the cell, hey, I've received a signal, let's respond to this. And once this signal goes into the cell, the cell can respond by turning on or off different parts of our DNA, uh, different segments called genes, right? You've probably heard of this. And certain genes on our DNA can code for different things. For instance, this part of the DNA, this gene might encode for cell growth. Uh, another part on the same DNA might encode for um, cell division. And still another gene might encode for something like cell death. So let's zoom out a little bit and take a big picture look at how this process works. Like, and let's use the example of cell death um, as the signal that's incoming, right? 
So maybe our neighboring signal tells the cell, hey, you know, you had a good run. It's time for us to walk to the light. We got to die. So it's going to send out a signal or a ligand that's going to bind to specific receptors that turn on the function of cell death, right? The signal is then transmitted into the cell and certain genes are turned on. As I mentioned, genes that code for cell death. They turn on, the cell performs the process of dying and everything works, right? But as I mentioned, this can also go wrong, right? These signals may be, may be misinterpreted and instead of cell death, we might see different outcomes. Different genes might be turned on instead, like cell growth. And the main culprit for this is mutations. Um, you've probably heard about mutations in the news, right? Particularly dealing with COVID-19, right? We had the wild, uh, the original strain of COVID-19. And then over time, we've seen different mutations in the spike protein, right? Those are the little knobs that are jutting out of our coronavirus. Uh, they've mutated and some of them have become more virulent or more effective, right? They're just more effective at getting into the human body and infecting our cells. And likewise, we can see mutations in receptors, uh, cancer mutations, which change the way the receptors behave. So instead of understanding our previous signal of cell death, now this mutated receptor might understand it in a different way. This is that miscommunication that we're talking about where that cellular phone call is misinterpreted by the receiving cell. So let's take a look, of, look at this through an example, right? another animated example. So here's our cell death signal that's released. And instead of binding to a normal receptor, if it binds to a cancerous receptor, which now misinterprets the signal, when this signaling complex is formed, we don't get the signal for cell death. Instead, it's changed now. It might be amplified or something so that now we think, oh, it's time to grow or time to divide. And as I mentioned, this, is, this can be really bad because instead of dying like the cell should, it's now instead growing or dividing, leading to potentially cancer. And the way we've targeted this or the way we've tried to treat this is often dependent on how we study these processes, right? Uh, and to give you an example of what I mean, let's imagine that we have several blind scientists trying to study and understand an elephant, right? Depending on what part of the elephant the scientists are studying, they may misinterpret what the elephant actually looks like or how it behaves, right? For instance, our scientists here at the bottom right might think that the elephant is actually more like a snake when he studies the trunk, right? It might feel more like a snake and he might think it behaves like a snake. Uh, likewise, the scientist on the top right who's looking at the ears might think that the elephant's actually instead more like a fan-like creature. Um, the scientist on the left looking at the tail might think the elephant's actually a rope-like creature. And similarly, the scientist on the top of the elephant might see the body of the elephant and think, oh no, it's more like a solid wall. So while all of these individual scientists aren't incorrect in their conclusions based on what they're studying, the overall function or the overall behavior of the elephant is not defined by its parts, right? The elephant instead does whatever elephants do. I guess remember things really well, right? Uh, it doesn't actually behave like a snake just because it has a trunk. And likewise, we've studied signaling in a very piecemeal way. And in doing so, we've targeted the specific parts that different labs focus on because we believe that those are very important. But this might not be the right answer to targeting the signaling pathway because the whole thing behaves very differently than just its parts. Uh, so what I mean by this is certain labs have looked at just ligands and how they behave, or other labs have spent 30, 40 years looking at just receptor ligand interactions, and other labs have looked at just how genes are turned on and off. And based on the results, we've created drugs to try and target this. Um, and unfortunately, we realize that this is a problem, but given the technology that we have, it's very hard to kind of zoom out and take the big picture view of this and try and target the whole process as a whole. But what I'm gonna do is zoom in a little bit and talk about this ligand receptor interaction, and how we've been targeting it lately for treating something like lung cancer, which is an area of uh, study that I'm focused in. So typically we know that bad signaling causes cancer, right? So oftentimes our resolution to this has been, okay, well, if it's bad signaling and it's not being understood pro properly, let's just turn it off, let's block that process. And so we've targeted different parts of the receptor and ligand to try and block bad signals or misunderstood signals. So one thing we've targeted, for instance, is this ligand receptor interaction, right? We've created therapeutics that prevent the ligand from binding to the receptor to try and turn off signaling. We've tried to create drugs that stop the signaling complex from forming and initiate signaling. And we've also created drugs that try and block the internal part of the receptor that starts signaling to the inside of the cell. With the whole idea being that, okay, 
these signals are bad, let's just turn it off. And in this way, we can combat or kill cancer. And while that sounds nice in theory and on paper, it hasn't really quite worked out as well as we'd like. And this is because more often than not, we see a resistance to cancer treatment or inhibitors that block signaling. We see that there's resistance to these treatments. And these arise from more mutations that happen to our receptor, right? So let me give you an example. If we have our person here who has, let's say, a mutated receptor that, has, uh, that gives them lung cancer, right? So we try to typically treat that with a first line of lung cancer treatment. We give them some drugs to try and help uh, stop the signaling. And oftentimes patients respond quite well. They live for another year or two. Um, we, see, uh, uh, we see them surviving quite well. But then after a little while, we see a resurgence of the cancer. And if we analyze the tumors that are growing there, these new tumors, we see that they actually have new mutations in them that make them resistant to the treatment that we originally gave them. And so then we kind of go back to the drawing board and oftentimes give them a second line of lung cancer treatment, which also usually works pretty well for a year or two. We see a decrease in the cancer, patients survive quite well for a year or two and they respond real well to treatment. But then again, another mutation arises which makes the cancer now resistant to this new treatment. And you can imagine how this can be a chain-like process, right? It could be quite cyclical. You treat the patient, they develop a mutation and are resistant. Treat the patient again with a new drug, Again, they resist the new drug because of the new mutation and so on and so forth. And at some point, we're gonna run out of drugs to treat them because they're just not going into the clinic fast enough, right? And we just can't combat all these new mutations that arise. So this really brings up a huge question in my field, right? How can these resistances to cancer treatment be combated? So to think about this, my lab has really started to reevaluate the whole signaling process, right? If stopping or shutting down signaling isn't really working, we started to wonder what else can we target if we don't wanna just block things, what else can we look at, right? And we realized that timing of signaling can also be very important in this whole signaling process. And what I mean by this is different ligands and receptor interactions can have different lengths of signaling, right? So for instance, this purple ligand interacting with our receptor can have a long interaction or a long signal, which tells the cell, hey, let's become very specialized. Let's reach this final state where we no longer grow and divide. Now, the same receptor can have another ligand shown here in gold, which instead of having a long interaction, sorry about that, has a short interaction, which tells the cell, hey, let's divide and grow, right? And you can imagine how in cancer, we'd want to avoid this short interaction signal and want to hopefully have these long interaction signals so that we don't see tumor growth. So we realize that if we start to understand these timing, uh, the timing of this signaling, we can start to think about more effective ways to create cancer therapeutics to help treat for something like lung cancer. And the way we've been studying this in my lab is by looking at individual receptors in individual cells. Uh, and to do this, we actually have to kind of do some tricky stuff because cells themselves are way too small for us to see. Um, you can see them under a microscope, but it's quite difficult. And proteins are much, much smaller than that. And actually are really, really difficult to see under the microscope without using what we'd like to think of as molecular light bulbs, right? We can attach these little glowing light bulbs to our receptors and they light up and we can track them. So we try and put different color light bulbs onto our receptors so we can track them individually and we can watch them as they interact. So here I'm showing a receptor with a green light bulb and one with a purple light bulb. And we can watch as they interact, there's gonna be a color chain and we can say, oh, now they're interacting and we can watch them as they move around on the cell. And in this way, we can understand how long they interact for. Eventually this pair will break up and we'll know how long they were stuck together. And in this way, we can really start to understand how long the signaling happens. What's the duration of this process? So now I'm gonna show you an actual experiment that um, I do in my lab. So here's that cartoon version now translated to the real world. Um, here on the left side, they're looking at a single cell with single receptors tagged with those uh, light bulbs. So one receptor is shown in green, another one is shown in purple. And what we're gonna do is watch them as they move around on the cell. So these are very dynamic, right? They move around all over the cell. And when they're not interacting, they're their individual colors, green and purple. And when they do interact, you're gonna see a changing color where it turns white. And it's by looking at the timing and duration of this white signal that we know how long they've interacted. So. As you can imagine, this is at the very forefront of research right now. So this is very bleeding edge science. Um, and we have a lot of work to do with this. So right now we're trying to understand the basics. How do receptors interact with different signals? 
But as we start to understand this more, we can change the experiments that we do. We can start to think about how do different signals alter timing? We can also start to think about how do different cancer therapies alter this timing? How can we fine tune this timing, right? We wanna think about how we can potentially change this timing with new cancer therapeutics. So if we go back to our idea of different interaction, right? Some receptors might have a long interaction based on the signal that they get, which tells them, hey, it's time to reach this finalized state. You know, we become very specialized, no longer growing and dividing. Other receptors can have short interactions with their, depending on the signal they get, that might tell them to grow or divide, which as I mentioned, could be bad for cancer. Well, what we want to do now is create some therapeutics that can fine tune or lengthen these short interactions. So here's this gold uh, ligand again. And instead of doing a short interaction with our drug here shown in red, we hope that it'll start doing longer interactions, which will change the cellular behavior, right? Instead of dividing and growing, instead, the signal that's sent to the cell is, oh, actually, we need to become specialized. We need to stop growing and dividing, reach this final state. And in this way, we hope that we can kind of turn bad actors into good ones, right? These bad cells, we can fine tune them or rewire them to behave properly so that they're no longer cancerous. Um, and it's really my hope that this is going to be the cutting edge of cancer treatment in the next 10 to 30 years, where we hope that by really understanding the fundamentals of this process, we can start to create new drugs that better treat our patients and provide better outcomes for our patients so that we don't see a resurgence of cancer that we've been seeing with the treatments that we're currently giving. So let me quickly summarize um, what we've talked about today, because I think this will also be very important for our other speakers' talks. Uh, so the first thing I think you'll hear from all of us is that cells are very talking. They're always making these phone calls, right? If your kids are bad with phones, cells are much worse. They're always talking to one another, sending signals back and forth, really understanding what's happening in their environment. And they use these signals to respond to that environment. And it's a miscommunication in these signals. When they misinterpret the signal, that's what causes diseases. So in my case, lung cancer. And with something like lung cancer, when we try to treat it by just shutting off the signaling, it hasn't really worked out quite well for us. We often see mutations that arise that resist treatment to these kinds of cancer therapies. So what we want to do in my lab is really refocus how we think about and how we treat cancer. Instead of just shutting down the signaling, we want to fine tune the signaling, create these therapeutics that change the timing of these receptors interacting so that we change what the signaling outcome is, right? And hopefully in this way, we create a better therapy for our patients that is more likely to just stop cancer from recurring as opposed to the treatments that we're currently giving. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Christina Cho, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about cancer and how cancer, use, uh, cancer uses some special ways, some sneaky ways to disguise themselves in our immune system. So let me give it over to Christina now. All right. Thanks, Krishna. That was great. So let me just get my pointer ready. Hi, everybody. So my name is Christina Cho, and today I'll be talking about communication inside the tumor microenvironment. So you were just introduced to the concept of cells signaling and communicating with each other. Well, today we're going to go specifically inside tumors to see how cells inside the tumors talk to each other, and what they talk about really determines whether a tumor continues to grow or actually shrinks and goes away. So cancer cells live in what we call a diverse tumor microenvironment. So a lot of people think that a tumor is just a whole bunch of cancer cells clumped up together. But in fact, a tumor is a large mass that contains cancer cells, as well as different types of normal cells and non-cellular components that help maintain the shape of the tumor. So if you look at this diagram here, you'll see that there are cancer cells present in the tumor, but there are also these other cells called cancer-associated fibroblasts, which is a type of normal cell, and immune cells. And all of these cells work together and communicate with each other to either help the cancer cells continue to divide and grow and form a larger tumor, or they can actually interact and prevent the tumor from growing very large. And so as Krishna mentioned in his talk, cells in the cells communicate with each other quite a bit all the time. And it's the same inside the tumor. And so cells communicate in the tumor and the different types of cells communicate with each other. So cancer cells talk to other cancer cells. Cancer cells can also talk to immune cells. 
And cancer cells can also communicate with the other normal cells, the cancer associated fibroblasts. And for the first part of my talk, I'll be primarily focusing on the communication between cancer cells and immune cells. So the immune system is the human body's defense against cancer. If we were to think of the human body as a nation, the immune system is like national security. And the national security team can be divided up into different groups. You have the reconnaissance team that goes in and surveys the, the nation or the body to look for foreign threats that could endanger the human body. And then you have the special forces team that gets information from the reconnaissance team to know specifically what to target, what threat to find and to eliminate that threat. Once that threat is eliminated, you have a resolution team that comes in and lets the special forces know that the threat has been terminated, all is well and clear, and now you are discharged and you can go home. In the same way, your immune system can be divided up into teams. So you have the reconnaissance team made up of a special type of cell called antigen presenting cells. And then you have the special forces team. An example of that are the killer T cells. And then you have the resolution team. And those are the regulatory T cells. And these cells all communicate together to make sure that your immune system is equipped and ready to fight foreign threats. And there is a chain of command. So you start with a foreign threat, and this threat is recognized by right, your Homeland Security, National Security, which then sends out your special forces to go and terminate that threat. In the same way, you have a cancer cell, and that cancer cell is acknowledged and recognized by the antigen presenting cell, which then lets your killer T cells know who to target and what to kill to help eliminate that cancer cell. And this is the chain of command. You have this communication that's happening between the antigen presenting cell and the killer T cell. So the killer T cell can do its job and go and terminate the cancer cells. I want you to pay attention to this word here, antigen. Some of you may be familiar with this word, but I'll explain a little bit as to what antigens are. So what is an antigen? An antigen is a distinguishing marker that tells the immune system that something is foreign. A really good analogy to this is an area code. So an area code will tell you whether a call is international or domestic or even regional, right? So as soon as you see that area code pop up on your phone, you know whether or not this call is coming from an area near you. In the same way, a foreign body um, will have this marker, this antigen that lets your immune system know that it actually doesn't belong here, that it's, it could be a threat, that it's something foreign and not natural to you. And so foreign objects like viruses, bacteria, and cancer cells all express these antigens that are recognized by antigen presenting cells. And so this is how our body knows when to and how to target cancer cells. You have a cancer cell that has a specific antigen. This antigen is recognized by the antigen presenting cell or your surveillance team. And that cell then presents this antigen to the killer T cells to let the killer T cells or your special forces to know exactly what to look for, what marker to look for, to know and specifically kill cancer cells in the body. This allows the killer T cells to go look for the cancer cell and terminate them. And this is a very tightly regulated process. Um, and the reason is you don't want the immune system to be hyperactive, to be chronically active, because chronic activation of the immune system can cause other diseases like COPD, diabetes, asthma, um, psoriasis. So you really want to make sure that your immune system is tightly regulated. And this, uh, and this regulation is mediated by a group of cells, the resolution team called the Tregs. So the Tregs come in and signal to the killer T cell, hey, the threat has been cleared, stand down, we're all good, the cancer is gone, and that shuts off the killer T cells from continuing its activity. And the T reg signals to the killer T cell using a very specific um, mechanism, and that's called the immune checkpoint. The immune checkpoints regulate the immune system to prevent chronic activation, and immune checkpoints are molecules that signal to the killer T cells to stand down. A really great analogy for this are code words. So the Treg will have a code word that signals to the killer T cell, hey, it's time for you to shut down. And in response, the killer T cell will have its own code word to say, I heard you loud and clear. I, I now know what my duty is, it's to shut down. An example of this immune checkpoint is the PDL1 PD1 um, 
signaling pathway. And basically the Treg will say the code PDL1 and the killer T cell in response to receiving that code will say PD1, code accepted. So I'll break this down just a little bit more. Earlier in Krishna's talk and also with the moderators, we brought up the idea of the receptor ligand interaction. So the ligand is presented and it binds, it's the color signal, right? It binds to the receptor, the antenna that lets the receiving signal know how to respond. So PDL1 is the ligand that is expressed by the Treg. So the Tregs have this ligand on the cell surface and that is going to now communicate to the killer T cells. And the killer T cells have the receptor PD1 that then receives that signal. And the interaction between PDL1 and PD1 causes the deactivation of killer T cells. So again, you have code PDL1 said by the TREG, the re resolution team. And in response, the killer T cell will say PD1 code accepted. I got you loud and clear. The chain of command has been completed and I will now go and deactivate. And this is exactly how your immune system works to uh, terminate diseases, but also to control itself. However, cancer cells have learned to hijack these immune checkpoints to hide from killer T cells. So under normal circumstances, you'll have a threat that's recognized by Homeland Security and terminated by the US Navy SEALs. And once that threat has been terminated, the SEALs get, a, uh, SEALs get the code PDL1, threat terminated, you are discharged. And cancer cells uh, are also terminated in the same way by your killer T cells. However, what cancer cells have learned to do is actually express the ligand PDL1. So they express the immune checkpoint and they shut down killer T cells prematurely. So instead of the killer T cells going and completing their job, they're inactivated and the cancer cells can continue to grow and divide and the tumors can get larger. So the way we in the field have tried to combat and fix this problem is by using immunotherapy. Some of you may have heard of this word or this type of treatment in the news. There's actually been a couple of advertisements for some of these immunotherapies that are currently available for certain treatments. So Keytruda and Optivo are two FDA approved immunotherapies for the treatment of cancer, specifically melanoma and lung cancer. And they are also in clinical trials for other types of tumors. And so the way immunotherapy works, at least these two specific immunotherapies, is that they are antibodies against PD-1. Some of you may have heard of the words or have heard antibodies in the news recently, especially because of COVID. And so COVID has these spike proteins and the vaccines help our bodies make antibodies that recognize those spike proteins or the antigen on the viruses that then terminates and gets rid of the antigen, right? So the antibodies are specific against PD-1, PD-1 being the receptor on the killer T cells. And how this works is the anti-PD antibodies or the immunotherapies will bind to the PD-1 receptor on killer T cells. And that prevents the cancer cells that express PD-1 from binding and terminating the killer T cell activity. And this allows the killer T cells to continue their function and get rid of and kill the cancer cells. And this has been effective for, um, a several, for several patients. And in fact, has improved the um, survival rate of patients with very aggressive metastatic diseases. And in fact, uh, immunotherapy has been very promising in oncology because it has less side effects than traditional chemotherapies. And it seems to be a lot more potent in activity. Unfortunately, what we've come to realize is that only a minority of patients actually benefit from this type of treatment. So the patients that respond to immunotherapy, the responders, are patients whose tumors shrink when they receive immunotherapy. However, the vast majority of patients are what we call non-responders. So even after they receive immunotherapy, their tumors do not shrink and their disease does not get better. And so the current big question in the field of oncology is why? Why is that some patients respond really well? And why do some patients don't respond at all? What is different between these two patients? What are the different signaling mechanisms that may be happening in the immune system or in the tumor itself? So one of the things um, we try to look at to find answers is the tumor microenvironment. So let's go back to the very first slide I showed you. 
I said that the tumor is a large mass that contains cancer cells, as well as different types of normal cells and non-cellular components that maintain the shape of the tumor. The question is, what are these normal cells really doing? And so one of the, fiber, uh, one of the cells that I study specifically are the cancer-associated fibroblasts the special type of normal cell that lives inside the tumor that communicates with the cancer cells and the immune cells. Now, cancer-associated fibroblasts are very, very special. They have many different types of functions. And so cancer-associated fibroblasts can produce different types of molecules that help cancer cells grow and divide, but they also, have, uh, they also produce certain molecules that actually recruit and uh, regulate the activity of immune cells. Cancer-associated fibroblasts also produce the non-cellular components that help maintain the shape of the tumor. So these cells are very um, active and very uh, important in the development and the progression of this tumor. So what my research really focuses on is how the cancer-associated fibroblasts communicate with the immune cells because a lot of research is beginning to show that cancer-associated fibroblasts communicate with the immune cells, actually causing them to become out of order, to become dysfunctional, so they cannot do their job. But no one really understands what that signal is. And that is where my research comes in. We're trying to figure out what that signal is that causes the immune cells to not work properly. If we were to figure out what that signal is, what that uh, communication is, we can possibly target it, shut it down, so that the immune cells can go back to doing their job. And so let me quickly summarize uh, my talk today. So the first point is that your immune system can detect and kill cancer cells through this chain of command. So you have cancer cells that present an antigen that is recognized by your surveillance or reconnaissance team, the antigen presenting cells which then let the killer T cells know exactly what marker, what antigen to look for, so that they can go and specifically kill cancer cells. Once the killer T cell has done their job, the T rex come in and communicate to the killer T cells using immune checkpoints to shut down the immune system to prevent chronic activation. Unfortunately, cancer cells have figured out a way to hijack these immune checkpoints to effectively hide from the immune system and prematurely shut down killer T cell activity. And with immunotherapy, we have been able to block this hijacking to reactivate the killer T cells. However, we still have a pretty big problem on our hands with the fact that the majority of patients do not really benefit from this type of therapy, despite the fact that it is less toxic than traditional chemotherapies, and it has prolonged the life of patients who, prefer, um, before this type of treatment, uh, pretty much had a death sentence. So right now we're trying to figure out how we can help non-responders become responders so that these therapies um, prolong their life. And so what I've talked about today is what happens when communication between immune cells goes wrong, right? So when communication between immune cells go right, when that chain of command is tightly regulated and going on correctly, the tumor shrinks. However, when communication between immune cells goes wrong, that chain of command is broken or hijacked by tumor cells, the tumor continues to grow. So the question that remains for the rest of today's talk is what happens when communication goes wrong in other parts of the body? And this is where Erica will come in and talk about what happens when communication between cells in the brain go wrong. And I'll hand it over to Erica. Thank you. See you now. Let me share my screen now. All right, so thank you all for being here today and thank you, Christina, for that wonderful talk. Um, as Nandini mentioned, my name is Erika Ojo Ramirez. I'm a neuroscientist at Yale. Today, I will tell you about uh, communication in our brains and how miscommunication between neurons inside our brains can lead to Alzheimer's disease. Let's recapitulate to see what we have seen today so far. Krishna just told us how cells communicate constantly through molecular signals that can lead to changes in the way that the cells behave, and that if we understand the timing of those signals, hopefully we can come up with new cures to treat uh, cancer. Christina told us how our immune cells can fight disease through tightly regulated messaging systems, 
and how tumors can hijack those systems to hide from our immune cells. We are now going to look inside our brains. Our brain uh, has many different types of, of cells inside, but the very, very uh, unique type of cell that resides in our brain are called neurons. Neurons have evolved to be able to trigger electrical signals that can allow us to respond to our environment with very fast uh, time scale, with millisecond uh, responses. And uh, it's the communication between neurons that allow us to behave, to respond, and to interact with one another. So let's see uh, how the brain looks like. If we could clear all the tissue and, and most of the cells and only look at one particular type of neuron that plays a very important role in memory storage and information processing, we will look at something like this. Uh, we can do this experiment in mice. Mice are very important model organisms for neuroscientists. And in this case, we have engineered this mice so that a particular type of neuron becomes shiny when we look at it in the microscope. So each shiny dot here is going to be the main body of the neuron. And then we will see how neurons can project these cables that travel uh, through lar large distances. And those cables are used to reach one another, to communicate with one another, and to send electrical, as well as chemical signals. All right, so now let's zoom in e more deeply into the neurons. What do neurons look like? If we look at neurons closely, we can see that they actually functionally resemble a lot like phones. Neurons have these very long protrusions. They look like trees. And these are the antennas of the neurons. Here is where neurons are going to receive all the signals that are coming from all the neighboring cells. And those signals will have to travel through these very tiny little cables and eventually reach the main body of the neuron. The main body of the neuron will integrate those signals, such as like a computer, and will determine whether the neuron has to make a phone call to a neighboring cell. If it decides to make a phone call, that means that the neuron is going to trigger a very fast current uh, that will reach all the other cells, communicating uh, what's happening. So now let's look deeply uh, in the molecular, at the molecular level. It turns out that neurons receive those phone calls in these very tiny uh, protrusions. They isolate each call uh, from each calling cell into protrusions that look like this. If we zoom in here, uh, we will see that when our color cell sends that electrical signal, that will stimulate the release of a molecule, ligand, but that we talked about before, and that molecule will bind to receptors on our neurons. Now, when these receptors are, uh, bind to these molecules, they will open. Some of them will allow charge and current to go through. That current is going to change the electrical properties of neurons and will uh, allow the neuron to send the call to other downstream cells. But other receptors are, uh, also exist in these places, and there are uh, the chemical receptors. Now, when these receptors bind to our uh, calling molecule, they will uh, trigger chemical response. And so neurons are going to be able to communicate with electrical and chemical responses and generate uh, the information and uh, memory that we know. So how does memory come about at the cellular level, the molecular level? That we hear and the song, uh, all those sound waves that are produced by the song get transformed into those uh, electrical signals by ourselves. Those electrical signals will uh, discharge those molecules and these molecules are going to bind to our receptors in our neurons and are going to generate currents and chemical changes. Those changes in the electrical and chemical uh, properties of our cells are going to determine whether we like or not like the song. Now imagine that we do like the song and now we hear the song again and again and again. And now what is happening is that our color cell is making very frequent, very frequent calls. Now our neuron is going to respond with very large uh, currents and very large changes. And what is going to be the resulting uh, effect of that is that the neuron will put more and more receptors on the membrane, more of these receptors that can generate charge. 
such that the next time that you hear that song that you liked, now our neuron will have the ability to respond with large currents. And that is what we understand so far uh, in, that, in a nutshell of what uh, memory formation is. Now, uh, what is happening in Alzheimer's disease and why these patients start to lose their ability to store memories, new memories? Alzheimer's disease, as you may know, is the most common form of dementia and is also the sixth leading cause of death in the US. It is characterized by a progressive loss of cognition and memory. And in the later stages of the disease, these patients start to lose their, their ability to be aware of their surroundings and to remember new experiences. Now, we don't know what causes Alzheimer's disease exactly, but we do know that it's characterized by two main features. The first feature is what we call neurodegeneration. And that just means that the neurons inside the brains of these patients start to die. If you compare the brain of an Alzheimer's disease patient that of a healthy individual, the brain looks smaller and has lost a lot of mass, a lot of cells. The second characteristic of Alzheimer's disease is what we call the beta amyloid plaque. So beta amyloid is a molecule that exists in the brain and plays a very important role in neurons communicate with one another. But somehow in these patients, this molecule, this molecule starts to be overproduced and it forms this aggregate surrounding neurons, the body of the neurons, and it becomes toxic, leading to the death of neurons. So let's see what is uh, beta amyloid and where it's coming from and how we can understand the function of beta amyloid in the context of communication between neurons. It turns out that in the place where, where neurons can communicate with one another, there are the receptors that I told you about, but there is also other molecules. One of them is called the amyloid precursor protein. Now, this, uh, this protein is a, plays a very important role in the formation and the maintenance of these regions where neurons communicate. This molecule can be cut with scissors. It can be cut uh, through the alpha cut, alpha scissors, and can generate this uh, yellow and brown fragment, which is okay. But it could also be cut with this beta scissors and generate this brown and blue fragment. That fragment is what is the beta amyloid. Now, this beta amyloid is important for regulating the phone call between neurons. When it is formed, it goes to the color cell and tells it, oh, maybe, maybe we should slow down the signal and inhibits that call. It regulates uh, the amount of, of communication. But when we overproduce the beta amyloid, now it starts to accumulate and form plaques cutting the communication between neurons. And when neurons cannot communicate with one another, then the cells start to die. So is there a way in which neural communication can produce a beta amyloid? Among the receptors that I told you about, when they bind to this, uh, the molecule from a color cell, some of the receptors can induce the cut through the alpha scissors, but some receptors can induce the cut through the beta scissors. So you can imagine that if we have an overactivation, a lot of activation of these receptors, now we're going to start generating a lot of this beta amyloid fragment, and which is going to accumulate and generate toxicity. So what we are doing now in terms of current therapies for Alzheimer's disease is to prevent the formation of beta amyloid. And one of the ways to do that, the most common treatment right now, is what is called the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. This is just a molecule that will enhance the signal through these receptors that induce the alpha cut to prevent this protein from, from being cut with the beta C. Um, these acetylcholinesterase inhibitors have uh, uh, improved the cognition of patients and also diminished the amount of beta amyloid plaques that are formed. So it's wor it works, but uh, long-term usage of these inhibitors it triggers compensation by neurons. So now neurons starts to make, uh, they make less of these signaling molecules because they, they see that the, the receptors have been overactivated. So they are not so useful for long-term usage. 
what we are currently developing now, developing now is more focused on molecules, molecules that can bind to those receptors and that can enhance those signals through the alpha scissors to prevent the toxicity through the beta amyloid formation. Another um, therapy that is currently under developing, development right now for Alzheimer's disease is what is called the beta amyloid immunotherapy. Christina just told us how the, our immune system is very powerful in fighting disease. Now, if we were to give the patients just a very small molecule, this very small part of the beta amyloid, just enough to train our immune system to go and fight those plaques, we could enhance, uh, enhance the survival of neurons and reduce the toxicity by beta amyloid. So this beta amyloid immunotherapy is now currently in clinical trials and is being tested. And with that, I would like uh, to finish our, our talk uh, summarizing what we have learned today in our game of cellular telephone. We have we learned from Krishna how if we understand the timing of communication between neurons, we can hopefully fine tune bad communication and find new cures for cancer. From Christina, we have learned how immunotherapy can block tumor cells from hijacking the messaging systems of our immune cells and hopefully improve the outcome of cancer patients. And I have told you how we can tweak how neurons communicate within our brain and uh, using these messaging systems to find new cures for Alzheimer's disease. And with, like, uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and thank you to Sinandini and Renuka for coordinating this talk. And we're happy to take any questions at the end. If you have any questions, you can put it in the chat. Um, or could unmute yourself as well. Don't be shy. <laughs> we like questions. It makes us, you know, faster on our toes and think. <laughs> Aha, good one. Oh, that, that was not a question. You're welcome. There's, a there's something in the Q&A. Yeah, there's a question here. Yeah, so the question is why uh, can Alzheimer's be inherited? So yeah. I'll let Erica maybe take a swing at that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So there are, um, there are certain mutations, and Krishna uh, told us about mutations, changes in the way in which our DNA is made. So there are certain mutations that are happening uh, within some of people's DNA that have molecules that lead to more generation of the beta amyloid. And um, if patients have those mutations, they tend to, gener uh, to develop the disease at early onset. So early onset of Alzheimer's disease is, is very, um, it's very hereditary. Uh, but late onset of Alzheimer's disease is less hereditary. And it, our understanding is that it has a component of our environment, changes in the way in which, in which our brain cells age, um, the normal aging process. Uh, in some cases, it could be chronic leading to disease. But yes, yeah, so there are certain mutations that can cause uh, changes in which the beta amyloid is formed and other, uh, other molecules that can also lead to the disease that can be, yeah, that can generate uh, early onset. We have another question from Elliot. Are these cell communications electrical or chemical or something else entirely? And if you want to take that. Yeah, um, I think as Erica had mentioned, some of them can be electrical. Um, some of them can also be um, 
chemical. O oftentimes, what we see in is a, is a mix of both. Uh, there's there's other cells besides neurons that also use kind of these electrical changes as well. But um, uh, but most of that is found in neurons, and most of the other cells typically use chemical uh, signaling. There's also um, biophysical signaling, which is like a whole other really cool thing. So in this, I talked about the non-cellular components that shape the tumor. Well, they, they can create um, different like structures that are different like stiffness. So like imagine like a table versus like a, like Play-Doh versus gel, like a Jello, right? And that different tenseness, uh, tenseness? Yeah, th that can actually change how your cells signal. So that's biophysical. So th there are very cool, so something else entirely includes one of those types of signals. We have a question from Nick. Um, is there a risk with immunotherapy drugs uh, of messing with your response to viruses and bacteria? Christina? That's a, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I, was like, that's, I think that's for me. <laughs> that's a really good question. So. The way immunotherapy is designed, it's for very specific antigens, right? So the PD-1, PD-L1, uh, that, that specific immune checkpoint, um, that is usually normally expressed on, between the Tregs and the killer T cells. And that happens in a very regulated, timely manner. So after your killer T cells have done your job. What makes immunotherapy against that really unique is that you only... Um, give it to patients whose tumors also express PD-1. So it's very, very specific to a very specific antigen. So it wouldn't mess up your immune system's ability to look for other antigens. So what your cancer cell expresses versus what your viruses might have or bacteria might have, they all have different antigens. And your immune system recognizes those different antigens in a, in a very specific way. So the immunotherapy should not affect your immune system's ability to find bacteria or find viruses. It just prevents your cancer cell from hijacking that very specific interaction between those specific immune checkpoints. Oh, and so we have another question from EJ. Why does breast cancer appear to be high in certain areas and not in others? Christina or Krishna? Uh, yeah, uh, I think that's a great question because I think I uh, clarified it by saying regions like Long Island, et cetera. And I think there's several factors that can play a role in this, right? I mean, uh, as I mentioned, our bodies also respond to external environmental factors too, right? So things like pollution or whatever can cause mutations in our, um, in our receptors that can then misinterpret these signals, right? Also different populations um, in different parts of the region or in different parts of the world can also be predisposed to have certain mutations uh, that might make them more prone to developing something like breast cancer. So it's a little bit of nature versus nurture kind of thing, right? Some, some things can be genetic and some things are also can be environmental and they, and they both all work together very intricately. So it's, it's a very difficult thing to untangle for sure. Our next question uh, is, do we know how often cancer cells actually develop in healthy people and are detected and killed? That's a Thanks. really good question. I was excited when I saw that question because it's a very smart question, Betsy. Smart question. So um, the, there's actually two schools, I'm not going to say two, two, but there are a couple of schools of thought. There are people who believe that at any given moment, there are cancer cells in the human body. And healthy individuals, your immune system is active and working, and they're killing those cancer cells, so they never form full-blown tumors. You don't actually get disease. You don't die from the cancer. And because there has been evidence of where you'll do an autopsy on a person who didn't die from cancer, and you'll find little cancer cells in the body. It's just it never became um, so ramp rampant. There wasn't so many that you became really sick. So there... There, are, there is evidence that shows that your immune system does fight off cancer. Uh, we, do we know how often? I don't think that's really known. There's a whole other group of people who think that that's not happening. <laughs> so there, there's a little bit of controversy there, but there is some evidence, at least with autopsy data, that shows that you know, people do have some cancer cells in their body and it looks like your immune system does work to fight that. Thank you. 
There's one. There's another yeah, question. I see one in the Q and A. Um, oh. I think uh, Erica, this is probably directed at you. It says, "Are there are there lifestyle changes that can help prevent dementia?" Yeah, yeah. Um, so we have seen an association of dementia with cardiovascular disease. Um, so it tends to come together in some instances, which has turned um, scientists to believe that if we can help our, our, our heart, if we can keep our healthy heart, it could help helpfully fight and uh, help us fight dementia. So, you know, through diet, through exercise, um, is a way to keep a healthy heart and keep the brain, uh, the oxygen supply to neurons, um, you know, proper. Um, another great way to enhance the brain and, and, and keep the brain sharp as much as we can is to train our brain, keep learning, um, keep stimulating those neurons uh, through learning processes, through new experiences, stimulating with social activities. All those things will keep our neurons busy, occupied, will you know help those synapses to keep um, keep them stable. So those are all um, things that we can do to prevent uh, dementia and other neurological diseases. I'll, I'll tack on to that slightly because Alex in the chat also asked a very similar question. Um, and I think basically everything you said, everything Eric said about the brain, I think you can apply to the rest of the body, right? Not just keeping the brain sharp, but also exercise does the same thing for a lot of these things if you want to keep. Uh, if you want to keep these cellular phone calls happening properly, it, it helps to have a healthy diet and to take that. that helps things go much, uh, mm -hmm. much more smoothly than if you were to slack otherwise. So at one of our talks, we were asked a similar question about whether there was any diet or food or something that can help um, communication between cells, making the call and other cells go better. And so I went and did a little bit more reading to come up with a much <laughs> better answer. So there has been direct evidence showing that a high fat diet can reduce your immune system's ability to fight cancer cells, right? And there's been a lot of studies actually showing that if you have a high fat diet, um, you reduce your immune system's ability to really find the cancer cell and then kill them. And they've shown that um, a diet that's more of vegetables and fruits, like a Mediterranean diet, does help improve your immune system's ability to fight, um, you know, uh, fight the good fight. So there are studies that do link a healthy diet to better immune health. We have another one from EJ. I think that's for Erica. If one pa a parent has dementia, will their children be more likely to have it as well? Yeah, uh, so not necessarily. Uh, dementias are caused, as we say, so they can be inherited. And those that are inherited tend to be the result of uh, a few genes that co can go wrong. Um, and so those will have a high probability yes, that you may, the children may develop if they, if they say we have two copies of the same gene, say if both genes are mutated, there is more probability um, depends on how, you know, how it works. But most of dementias likely are actually the result of many, either many combinations of potential mutations or risk factors. So unless, yeah, so I don't think most dementias are inherited. Uh, and some of them, like Alzheimer's disease, we do know that if some people have certain gene, gene mutations, we do know that there's a high likelihood that the children will have, will develop Alzheimer's disease but that's in a fewer percentage of the case. Most cases are late onset and is the result of accumulations or, or either changes in our genes that happen over time or changes in an environment that have accumulated with the aging process. So, yes. Another related question for you, Erica, um, is, is there a cure for dementia on the horizon? Yeah, on the horizon. <laughs> So we're all working really hard to find uh, the, the cure. So there is no cure. Uh, I don't think there is cure yet, but we have treatments uh, that can um, help with the symptoms. Like the, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors treatment right now, it does help with the cognitive decline and with the toxicity at the neuronal level. So we have ways of treat it, but no cure yet, I don't think, for most of the dimensions. 
uh, what we need to understand really, and that's why research is so important to understand what is really the cause, what is the reason, the underlying cause. It's very hard sometimes to know to distinguish effect from cause. Like we know betaminoid starts to form, and we think that is obviously very important, but is that the reason um, that leads to Alzheimer's disease? Or, or there's another reason, and betaminoid is just one of the characteristics, right? So if we have that's why research is important as much as we can understand the disease in animal models and we can test new cures to fight the cause. So, yeah, um, there is no cure, but there are treatments that can be improved, uh, that can improve the symptoms. And uh, over time, as we understand the disease is better, different forms of dementia, we should hopefully... Um, and there are many different types of dementia, like some dementias are the result of deficiency in some sort of vitamin, vitamin, for example, or post-stroke dementia. Like for, a, for a period of time, patients sort of lose the ability, cognitive decline, but it's, but it's just a result of a, a minor stroke, for example, and those can get better over time. Um, yeah. um, another question for Erica, uh, can migraine be cured and is this related to neuronal connection or cells? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I have to be honest with you, I'm not very familiar with the migraine literature. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have maybe half of migraines and inflammation response potentially due to maybe, yeah, an immune response to an infection or something related. Um, I know it's cured with painkillers, but over time people lose sensitivity to those painkillers. Yeah, so if you like, you could write me and uh, I, you know, I can do some more research for you and uh, give you more information. I'm not an expert on migraine, but I can give you more information if you like. I think they also use Botox for migraines. What is that? They use Botox injections for migraines as well. Really? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's like a thing that people do. Botox is amazing, not just for your face. <laughs> yeah. Another question, um, is stress or inflammation implicated in the development of cancer? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> That's a very straightforward <laughs> answer. Definitely. And yes, um, stress does, uh, does affect uh, cancer growth. And, and there's, I don't, I can't tell you the details of the studies right at the moment. If you are interested in specific studies, you can also contact me. Um, but I think they've done some exercise. There's an, there's an entire field called F exercise oncology, right? So they really look at how you can reduce your stress to improve at least um, the efficacy of certain chemotherapies and really help uh, reduce the, the growth or slow down the growth of your tumor. So yeah, stress has been shown to um, make cancer worse. Is like this. Like, so I think stress yeah. diminishes the ability of the immune system to fight, right? So yeah, that's really yeah. Stress really reduces your immune system's ability to work properly. So in in all diseases in general, stress is no bueno. Um, another question: How does stress cause cancer? <laughs> I will email Chris. Yes, Carmen, email me. I don't, um, I, I don't know off the top of my head right now. How does stress, that's, that is probably literally what an entire field studies. How, trying to figure out the exact signaling mechanisms of how stress causes cancer. So there are certain pathways, signaling pathways. So we showed earlier receptor ligands, and then you saw that like Wi-Fi kind of signal, right? There are specific pathways called stress pathways, right, that get activated when cells feel stress. And um, it was, those pathways are not regulated properly. They're not shut down and controlled properly. They can promote um, cancer growth. So um, please email me. I will put my email there and I will make sure I get you the information that you need if you have more questions. Also, as a more general answer, it kind of just changes the microenvironment, right? So I think uh, if you kind of think back onto also that tumor microenvironment also gets mm -hmm. changed too, right? With, with stress, which can promote cancer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's, it's definitely a complex. Field. 
And we have, does alcohol kill brain cells? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's really, it a really interesting question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so we do know that long-term usage of alcohol, right? So people that have long, um, like alcoholic for a long time, they can develop dementia. And it's one of those forms of dementia that is reversible. So when people stop drinking, they can eventually recover all those uh, cognitive functions back. Uh, now, alcohol, yeah. So there are receptors in our brain uh, that are particularly sensitive to the alcohol molecules. And it's interesting. Some of them are these receptors that instead of creating electricity, block inhibit electricity from going, going through these receptors. So alcohol definitely changes the way in which neurons will work. And long-term uh, long usage can definitely alter your cognitive function. Um, I don't know that there is a way in which alcohol specifically can kill the cells, but by preventing their proper communication, it will start affecting the way in which neurons just, you know, how healthy they are. Because neurons are healthy when they can communicate, they can respond, they can produce chemicals. Um, so yeah, not recommended heavy uh, alcohol usage. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Elliot. Is anyone studying the evolution of immune systems? It seems a very complex part of living entities that must have developed in interesting ways. Interesting question. Yeah, for sure. So there's a group at the, the famous groups that I can think of. There's a group at Stanford and Columbia and Harvard. They they study specifically directed evolution. So this so this is a very specific part of the immune response, but it's to bacteria. And they try to figure out how the bacteria in your gut have evolved and affected how your immune system responds and reacts to that. And there are definitely um, groups all over the country and the world that study um, the evolution of the immune system and, and between species. And it, it's, it is a very big, big field, way out of my scope of research. But there are people out there who study it for sure. Something interesting related to that is that many of the molecules involved in the brain are actually happening in the immune system. Yeah. So it's like the immune system somehow evolved eventually to just come up with a brain, but they are like, you can find those receptors for immune cells, you can also find them in the brain. Yeah, they were very interesting. And they have a memory, right? The immune cells have a memory mechanism, which the brain also, the neurons yeah. are parallels. We have another question from Lillian. How does cytokoline affect the brain or memory? Acetylcholine. I don't see that question. Where is that? Oh, I see that. In the Q&A, yeah. Acetylcholine, or you mean acetylcholine? I think so. I think you mean acetylcholine? Yep. Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, so that's a really good question. Acetylcholine is a type of, when I call it a color cell, can release those signals. Acetylcholine is one of those signals um, that can bind to a specific receptors. We actually call them acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors. And in Alzheimer's, uh, particularly the, the neurons that express those acetylcholine receptors are the ones that start to die first. So that's why acetylcholinesterase inhibitors is the first line of treatment for Alzheimer's disease because it tries to recover that loss of acetylcholine signaling. And so acetylcholine uh, is, is the molecule that binds to acetylcholine receptors. At the, acetylcholine receptors can be electric, they can also be chemical. And we are just trying to understand how are they different from other receptors like glutamate receptors or GABA receptors. But yes, yeah, so they are, they are expressed, they are in those cells that start to die in Alzheimer's This is first. And that's why we are trying to, to trigger those. It's very important. And they are also related with the formation of beta amyloid. So it's exactly those acetylcholine, acetylcholine receptors that can or cannot be, make the beta amyloid. That's why it's the first line of treatment for Alzheimer's disease right now. It's a great question. <laughs> I think one quick thing for Eric and Christina, I think when you put in your emails. You guys sent it to Just Channel. So if you want to- Oh, it, <laughs> oh sorry, everybody. Let's try this again. We did what? We sent it to the panelists instead of the actual people. So oh. the I have your email, so I don't need it. Thank you. <laughs> but I'm assuming other people do. 
I hope that got to Carmen. That so one. sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much for tonight. It sounds like you guys have answered all the questions. We really appreciate it. You guys have been so generous with your time. We are recording this program this evening. So for anyone that had to step away, you will be able to access it. And just really want to thank our brilliant panelists for spending this evening with us. Thanks thank for joining you. us. That was so have cute. a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye. Bye.